Welcome everyone to the Baha'i Publishers. Oh, you're gonna play that? No, okay. Welcome everyone to the Baha'i Publishers panel discussion sponsored by the US Baha'i Publishing Trust and the Wilmot Institute. Our 90 minute program today will cover the sorts of manuscripts that publishers are looking for and the publishing process that is followed once the manuscript has been accepted. We will also hear about literature review, which is a requirement of all publications by Baha'is that mention the Baha'i faith. Joining us today are Bahaj Taherzadeh, the senior editor at the Baha'i Publishing Trust in Wilmette, Illinois, Erica Leith, a director and manager at George Ronald, based in Wellen in the United Kingdom, May Hoffman, a director and editor at George Ronald, and Martha Schweitz, who serves as coordinator of review at the United States Baha'i National Center. I'm Robert Stockman, director of the Wilmot Institute. Each of our distinguished panelists will speak for about 10 minutes on the topic of the day, and then we will take questions. Please pose your questions in the Q&A form, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. We will reserve the chat function for other things like, as someone noted from an earlier session today, people are announcing weddings. Uh, and uh, things like that, that will just distract us. We'll have trouble finding your questions uh, if we have them in the chat function as well. So without further ado, I will now turn us over to the panel and we will begin with Bahaj. Bahaj, thank you for participating today. Thank you, Rob, and, and everyone for joining us. Um, it's really quite uh, exciting to be part of this today, and it feels like quite an unusual and rare thing um, to have the opportunity to, to sit with, with the staff of George Ronald and be here on behalf of the US Publishing Trust and to hopefully share ideas and, and hear about you know what one another are up to it, it's it's an unusual thing and uh hopefully the first of of many um i'll talk briefly just about the publishing trust um the publishing trust of course is the publishing arm of the national spiritual assembly and was established in 1955 under the direction of shogi effendi the publishing trust has its origins in in earlier efforts than that and the early baha'is in the north american community at the time of abdul baha really kind of put the wheels in motion in terms of beginning to publish baha'i literature in in this country but it's the publishing trust has existed in its official form since since the 50s and so the the any Baha'i Publishing Trust has several responsibilities that maybe um, distinguish them from an independent publisher like George Ronald. I'll talk a little bit about that because maybe it's it's worth making that distinction. And you know, our primary responsibility and function and purpose really is to sort of be a custodian for the sacred and authoritative texts of the Baha'i faith and to keep those in print. One of the interesting things about the US Publishing Trust is that the Guardian gave all of the copyrights of his translations of the sacred texts to the United States National Assembly. And so quite a lot of our time and resources and energy goes into keeping those sacred and authoritative texts in print, producing them in such a manner that's as befitting as possible of the sacred nature, but also making them as available and accessible and affordable as possible to the Baha'i community. So that is really our primary function. But uh, as you likely know, we, we publish quite a wide range of literature by by authors. Um, the Publishing Trust has three imprints currently, three publishing imprints that we publish our books on. So we have Baha'i Publishing, we have Bellwood Press, which caters to children and junior youth and youth, 
And then we also have an imprint called One Voice Press, which the National Assembly acquired a few years ago, which sort of offers an outlet less directly associated with the faith. But ultimately our, <clears throat> our goal and our aim with all of these imprints is to produce material that benefits the Baha'i community and that potentially reaches beyond the Baha'i community. Our um, overall focus really at the Publishing Trust in the past 10, 15, 20 years has been uh, what, what we've called trade publishing, which is essentially is um, books that we've produced and developed as much as possible for a general audience. So these books are being marketed through um, the wider industry channels beyond the Baha'i community. And they're as much as possible developed and edited in such a way that they are accessible to people, regardless of whether or not they are Baha'is. This doesn't apply to every book that we publish, certainly, but it has been, uh, it's taken a great deal of our focus in, in the last couple of decades to try to, to provide materials is in as accessible way as possible to the general public. So some of the categories of books that we publish would be histories and biographies um, related to the faith. Many of those would perhaps be primarily of interest to a Baha'i audience at this time, but not necessarily exclusively. Um, we do introductory books about the faith. We do compilations on various themes. We have done some fiction, um, some for younger readers, some for adult readers. We are always looking for books that fall within the um, realm of social discourse books that offer a Baha'i perspective on global issues or social issues of global importance. And for the most part, the message really um, that I want to convey to participants today, anyone who is interested in writing, is that the door is, is wide open. Um, we have an open submissions policy. If you send a manuscript to the Publishing Trust, it will be read. It will be evaluated very carefully. And if it's something that either we publish or eventually will be published within the United States, it will go to the review office of the National Assembly. Um, I won't talk much about that process because Martha Schweitz is here and she'll she'll be able to speak about that. But those are two distinct processes that happen when a manuscript comes to us. One is our editorial evaluation in which we decide if this is something that's a good fit for the publishing trust to, to publish. And the other is, is the review office, which um, is the purpose of that is to see if the manuscript essentially portrays the faith accurately and with appropriate dignity. So, I won't, I don't think I'll go into a great deal in terms of the editorial process. If something is accepted for publication, it's of course um, scheduled, you know, it, it's, it, we find a way to fit it into our schedule. An editor is assigned to work with the author who submitted it and it goes through a pretty rigorous editorial process, which is often uh, involves some collaboration and consultation with the review office. But there may be questions that'll come up and that will, you know, that will cause more elaboration on those subjects. I won't, I won't go into them so much right now. Um, I think there's a lot of things I could say about what we're looking for. I think ultimately we are looking for manuscripts that will serve the National Assembly in its efforts to carry out the goals of the nine-year plan in this country. So I think a very wide range of types of books can fall within that, that broad framework of the plan. But that is what is always in our sights. Um, and 
as the publishing arm of the National Assembly, we have a lot of considerations. Anytime a manuscript comes to us, um, you know, regarding what's appropriate, what's needed, and what's the most valuable use of our resources as the publishing agency of the National Spiritual Assembly. So the door is wide open. We'll we'll include some information here in the in the chat with you know with links if, if people are interested in in seeing the process and the email addresses and, and, and things that you know that are needed for, for submission. But I think I'll probably leave it at that for now. Um, I think there's probably going to be a lot of ground to cover and questions that will come up throughout the, the course of our consultation. So I'll, I'll pass it on. And I think Erica is next. Yes, and I'm going to uh, share a video here, not a video, a, a PowerPoint. Um, Right, I hope everybody can can uh, see this and that you can hear me properly. Yep, we're well, good. See you. Yeah, yeah. okay, good. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is, is what happens when uh, we get a manuscript sent to us. We don't normally commission work. Uh, occasionally we have, but not very often. Uh, but first, let me introduce the team to you. Uh, so you will see that there are three older women here and uh, three younger, and we're hoping to pass the, the, the mantle on to, to the younger crew uh, uh, so that the older ones can actually retire. We're all well past our retirement age. Um, if you, uh, th this is Yas Tahazade. She's she edits for her, for us. Um, Harry Leith. She she's my daughter, and she she processes uh, the orders. That's me. That's May. Which you'll hear from her later. This is Carmel Moman, uh, who is Wendy's daughter, uh, and she does a lot of of our promotion. So that's the team. So when somebody sends us a manuscript, uh, what do we do? Do we accept it? Do we reject it or make no decision? If we reject, there may be some reasons for not, re not accepting it. The first one could be that there's no Baha'i content. We don't uh, publish anything that doesn't have Baha'i content in it. Uh, it's badly written. Yeah, we'll, we'll skate over that one. Um, and it's or it's too close in subject matter to another book. Occasionally, we get two manuscripts that are almost uh, are of the same material, um, and and we can only publish one of them. Um, recent recently, we had um, two translations of, of the same book. We could only choose one of them. Or the book, it may be too specialized. Uh, if, if we're only going to sell it to six people, uh, this may not be the best use of our time. Sometimes we make no decision at all. Uh, so we might write to the author and say, please write more. You haven't, you've only sent us half a book here. Please write less. Uh, because you've sent us three books uh, dressed up as one book, or we'll ask the author to rewrite a significant amount of the book. And at this point, we don't commit ourselves to publishing, although we would give uh, information and, and advice to the authors, we are not going to commit ourselves. But if we like the, the, the manuscript and we want to publish it, then we set up an agreement with the author that we will publish it within a certain amount of time. And there are some things that we will do, some things that they will do. Uh, and we assign an editor to work on the manuscript. And hers is definitely the biggest job and May will talk more perhaps about that later on. 
So what does an editor do? She checks for accuracy. Uh, she makes sure the assumptions about the readers is consistent. So um, you would not, to for a book that was uh, aimed at Baha'is, you wouldn't go into great lengths to explain who Abdul Baha was, for instance. The, the, the styles are consistent. So you, you need the, the um, the author to be talking to the same with the same voice all the way through the book, not to children to start with, and then uh, PhD uh, uh, adults uh, at the end. And we may suggest to the author uh, addition, or she may suggest to the author additions, deletions, amendments, and there is a lot of. Um, time spent uh, going backwards and forwards. Uh, we do the copy editing at the same time. So the, our authors will be checking for its, the spelling mistakes, uh, grammar, punctuation, etc. So the author and the editor will work very closely at this point. And um, it's important for the editor and the author to actually see that they're, they're both uh, working for the same outcome, that they are both trying to get the best book uh, and that the editor is not somebody who is like their um, English teacher at school and out with the red pen and um, giving a mark at the end. So that, that's what happens there. Once the editing is done, the book is taped sent for typesetting so that this is actually one of my jobs. Uh, we want to make the book look good uh, so it, it, it's going for typesetting and at this point which is when the editing has been done we also send the book to Baha'i Review. Uh, th this is much later than, than the publishing trust does. Uh, what decisions do we make about the book? What size it's going to be? Uh, what typeface? How big the typeface is? Will it have pictures? If they are, if they're pictures, are they going to be drawn or are they photos? Uh, where are these photos going to come from? If there are photos, who's going to be the, doing the drawings? Will it have an index? Uh, some books really need an index. Others just don't. Uh, how many to print? Uh, this is something that has changed over the years. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, we were doing far bigger print runs than we now do. Uh, once the typesetting has been done, uh, we will then uh, oops, uh, it, send it back to the editor who will read through it, uh, also to the author to make sure uh, that that it looks good. This is definitely not an opportunity for an author to write, rewrite their book. It, it, it is now at a place where it can't comfortably be changed. Uh, we will then sign a, a, a proofreader um, and the corrections will be collated by the editor. So any, any that the authors picked up, any that the proofreaders picked up, will be sent back to the author and return, and then the, those are returned to the typesetter. Uh, for the cover, we may uh, ask the author for suggestions, but the final decision is ours. And uh, sometimes uh, we like the, uh, a particular cover, but the author doesn't. And if the, the author is not, not happy, then we're, we're willing to, um, to ask, ask the, our designer uh, to, again to, to, to redesign. How many books to, re to print? Well, we need to think about how popular the book's going to be. Uh, if it's very popular, then a thousand may be. These days we do no, no more than a thousand. It's very unlikely that we'll, we'll do a thousand. Uh, we might do a digital print run of 500 copies, 
or we might go to print on demand and the more and more we're going to print on demand. Uh, it gives us the flexibility to see whether the book is um, going, going to, to flourish or not. Um, and we also do an ebook most of most of our titles, not all of our titles. Um, the books are if if they're uh, sent, if they're done conventionally or or there's a, a, a print run, then they are sent to one of our two uh, what the where, warehouses we use, um, one in the UK, one in, in the US. Um, and uh, if they're print on demand, then they can be printed instantly in the UK, US and Australia and sent out to, to customers directly. They don't need to go back to our warehouses. Uh, we do some advertising. Uh, so we prepare flyers for, for our books. Uh, and these are sent out uh, to, to our mailing list, our emailing list. We put books on our website, uh, which is grbooks.com. Uh, we put them on Facebook and we put them on Amazon. And it, it's really helpful if also the author can help promote the books because that makes a huge amount of, uh, of difference. And then we hope that the book will sell. So I'll pass on to May now. You're muted, May. Oh, there you go. Yeah, thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I don't see you, but I know you're there. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about, um, I, I guess it's really a personal view of editing because I've now been doing this for over 50 years. Um, and as, uh, as, as Eric said, you know, well, what's an editor? What do Ericas do? What do editors do? It's a really umbrella term, which has a lot of different skills and actions, um, which, which some of which are sort of incompatible at the same time. So for instance, there could be structural editing, where you look at the book and think, ooh, um, that chapter would be better off coming a bit earlier or later. Or I wonder if, you know, that's an interesting idea. Would the author be prepared to expand that some, somewhat? Um, or, and then there's content editing, which definitely involves a lot of fact checking and uh, making sure that what is said is accurate. And also then there is the, um, the, the, the question of wisdom. Is this a good thing to say now? And I, I don't know how many of you listened to Angelina Allen's presentation earlier, but I, I was so glad to see that she um, gave quite a lot of attention to a letter of the House of, from the Universal House of Justice in August 2019, which talks about uh, being truthful and accurate, but also with due regard for people, if you're in a, writing a biography, for instance, or talking about somebody, um, their dignity and their privacy. There's a wonderful letter there if, if you, um, if, if, if you can get hold of it. Um, so the editor does all that kind of thing as well. And then of course, there's, as it were, the housekeeping aspects, the copy editing, as Erica said. Um, and there, there are whole books written about copy editing. George Ronald has a house style, which we try to apply. Um, now, what else am I looking at? Yes, um, so the, all, the, the editor does a, a variety of things. Um, very often we make the index too. We'll be working on the photographs. We may be writing captions for the photographs. We'll certainly be working out where the photographs should be placed in the book. There are conventions about this, that for instance, you don't place a photograph 
before the text which which describes it so, you know there, there, there are all kinds of sort of little conventions like that um, but coming on to another point is the idea of the of voice for me particularly that's extremely important I mean I cut my teeth as it were as an editor on Marzia Gale's books and then on Adib Tahazadeh's series The Revelation of Baha'u'llah and I, I, I do want to tell you just one thing that really helped me in this a few years before I started working on those things there was a an international youth conference in I think 1971 in Stras in um, Salzburg, Austria, and I was on the program committee. Now, yes, I am very old, but at that time I was a youth. And um, one of the things the members of the program committee had to do once you got the program done was to actually herd people from the corridors into places where the lectures and the talks were being given. And on one occasion, I noticed that it was just after lunch and the afternoon session was due to begin. And there was hardly anybody in the lecture room. And I thought, well, where can they all be? And so I sort of went searching. Because there were more than a thousand people at that conference. And I found them in the dining room, packed, listening to Adib Tahzadeh telling stories about the early days of the faith, the believers in the time of Baha'u'llah. Well, of course, anybody who's read the, that series on the revelation of Baha'u'llah knows that there are lots of those stories in there. And at, cert, at one point, somebody said to me, ah, don't let him get, you know, sidelined with all those stories. You know, it's, he's writing about the tablets and writings of Baha'u'llah. And I thought, no, no, that, that is Adib's voice. The stories are really important and one must preserve his voice. And ever since, one of my main um, concerns as an editor is to preserve the author's voice. That is that, as Erica said, I do not get out a red pencil and rewrite a sentence in the way that I might write it. That's not my job. What is my job? is to make sure that that sentence or that paragraph or that chapter is coherent and consistent and does what the author wants it to do. You know, somebody once said, uh, as an editor, whose side are you on? Are you on the author's side or are you on the reader's side? Well, really both. I'm definitely on the author's side. And I'm definitely on the reader's side. And one of the most important things I find, and one of the great joys of being a, an editor of Baha'i books in this, because you know what, what we want to do is, is present and provide inspiring and authentic Baha'i books to readers that, that will lift them up. Um, so, um, I remember in, in another editorial, um, in, in another editorial situation, I had two male colleagues and we were discussing what we were doing, what, what were we really? And one of them, one of the, one of the men said, oh, you know, we're in the position, we're the last line of defense. In other words, it was about not letting mistakes get through. And the other one said, similarly, he said, well, we're the goalkeeper. And I thought, no, I don't see myself that way. I'm a midwife. <laughs> the author, male or female, is the mother. The book is the baby. And the job of the editor is to help this baby be born in the most beautiful way possible. So you really have to, as an editor, I find, um, have the trust of the author. And when you have the confidence between the two of you, things go much better. 
Now, have I got any more time left? Um, yeah. Um, what kind of books are we looking for? Well, as the nine year plan opens and this wonderful 25 year cycle begins, the whole Baha'i world um, is looking to become more outward looking and to concentrate particularly on the society building power of the Baha'i teachings. So yes, there are some books that we need which are really only going to be of interest to Baha'is at the present time, as Bahaj already said. But there are others where we really need to bear in mind the society building power of the faith and that we have to be um, very outward looking. So as uh, Bahaj also said, the door is always open. You may feel that there are some that your book is more suitable for an official Baha'i Publishing Trust. There are others which might be better off with an independent Baha'i inspired uh, publisher such as ourselves. And um, I, I have found it very interesting recently uh, that in a letter from the Universal House of Justice to George Ronald telling us that they wanted us to continue as a publisher in our own right. In other words, not um, as a part of, a, of an official Baha'i Publishing Trust. Although we are very good friends with all Baha'i Publishing Trusts. So I think that probably covers what I need to say. And it's now over to Martha. Thank you. Greetings, everybody. Um, I'm here to give a brief overview of the review process as it is carried out in the United States. Um, as you know, the guidance is you know, the same internationally, but there are you know, details in terms of the process and procedure that vary between, uh, between countries. Um, so as you know, and has been mentioned, uh, there is a requirement in the faith for review of any work that is, to be, uh, that is written by a Baha'i that has specific Baha'i content uh, to be reviewed before it is published. Uh, this was a process initiated by Abdul Baha and continued by the Guardian and, uh, and uh, Abdul Baha uh, while the faith is still in its infancy and uh, susceptible to being misunderstood by the public. So the um, House of Justice has continued it to date. They can uh, re remove that requirement whenever they do appropriate. Um, Boyd, we can start with the PowerPoint. Thank you. So I'd want to begin with this quote from the House of Justice. Um, it's in response to a Baha'i inquirer. This is a letter from 1988. Um, and uh, the inquirer was saying, well, now that the faith has emerged from obscurity, which the House had announced a few years earlier, isn't it time to uh, remove the review requirement? And this is part of their response. You can see more, there's much more very uh, moving language in the full version, which is cited there. But let me just read this part. The faith is as yet in its infancy. Despite its emergence from obscurity, even now the vast majority of the human race remains ignorant of its existence. Moreover, the vast majority of its adherents are relatively new Baha'i. The change implied by this new stage and its evolution is that whereas heretofore this tender plant was protected in its obscurity from the attention of external elements, it has now become exposed. This exposure invites close observation, and that observation will eventually lead to opposition in various quarters. So far from adopting a carefree attitude, the community must be conscious of the necessity to present a correct view of itself and an accurate understanding of its purpose to a largely skeptical public. A greater effort, a greater care must now be exercised to ensure its protection against the malice of the ignorant and the unwisdom of its friends. It went on to say that if we to whose care this plant has been entrusted are insensitive to its tenderness. The great tree, which is its certain potential, will be hindered in its growth towards the spreading of its sheltering branches over all humankind. Particularly must we be concerned about the effects of words, especially those put in print. It is here that Baha'i authors and publishers need to be attentive and ex exert rig rigorous discipline upon themselves 
as well as abide by the requirements of review. So from there, um, I'm just going to uh, explain some of the basic uh, basic requirements um, of the review process. Boy, it's not advancing for me. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Okay. So um, the purpose and criteria uh, for review is that the faith must be presented accurately in conformity with the teachings and with dignity. Uh, there's also a requirement of timeliness, as I think was alluded to, something may be accurate, um, but if it publishing it at this time would endanger the Baha'is in Iran, for example, it, it clearly should not be published. Um, the uh, authors are invited more than welcome and should be publishing their own um, uh, views and understandings of the teachings. It's just that those opinions and views need to be clearly uh, separated from the writings. It needs to be clear when it's opinion and when it is an explicit teaching that is being uh, cited. Um, review does not concern with proofreading all the high quotes. Um, reviewers, of course, check anything that seems off will be brought to attention, we'll do a spot check, but it is the author and the publisher's responsibility to proofread all the high quotes and make sure they're completely accurate. Uh, review is also not uh, concerned with the literary merit or style uh, of a work, its marketability, or general copy editing. Reviewers sometimes will by the, go beyond that and offer comments on how to improve the work in general, or even on the content that is not specifically about the faith. Um, if they do, it's merely a suggestion. Authors often appreciate that, but it's certainly not part of review. Uh, what needs to be reviewed are any works that have specific Baha'i content. That can mean quotes, explicit references to the teachings, the central figures, history, community life. Uh, if it is only a passing reference to the faith or uh, describing Baha'i principles, but not expressly identifying them with the faith, uh, then there's really nothing to review because the book is not in the eyes of a reader representing the faith at all. Um, as for online materials, uh, things which are informal uh, on social media, blogs, YouTube, personal websites, uh, those are not subject to review. However, if something rises to a higher level of formality, such as an ebook or a journal with institutional sponsorship, be it Baha'i or um, other, uh, then that does need to be reviewed. Uh, Certain things are reviewed at the national level and certain things at local. I know this may vary sometimes between countries, but in general, uh, throughout, uh, the National Assembly is responsible for reviewing literature for broad or national international distribution and all audiovisual materials uh, and music, CDs, DVDs, films. In the case of films, the script should be reviewed and approved before the filming is done, which is then a second review process. Um, at the local level, Literature, which is only for local use, is reviewed, such as something for a community event, and all special materials, regardless of the extent to which they will be distributed. And that includes things like you know, artwork, greeting cards, t-shirts, uh, simple calendars, that sort of thing. And there's guidance in uh, the chapter nine of guidelines for local spiritual assemblies about the local level review, especially, and some general principles of review. Um, as for which country reviews an item, this is not always um, obvious at the beginning because an author may not know where their book is going to end up getting published. But if it will be published by a publishing company, uh, then it should be reviewed by the National Assembly in whose jurisdiction that work will first be published. And it should be reviewed before it's submitted to the publisher, unless it's the pub Baha'i Publishing Trust or a Baha'i-owned publisher, in which case uh, review and evaluation by the publisher can happen at the same time. Uh, for self-published works, uh, an author should send the manuscript to their own National Spiritual Assembly where they re reside. And again, it should be published, uh, uh, reviewed before it is uh, published or submitted to a self-publishing service. If it's not clear where to submit something, um, you know, contact the review office in your country and it can be uh, discussed. Um, there's all kinds of other um, specific guidance in the review area, uh, things like um, provisional uh, English translations of the writings, uh, memoirs and historical documents from countries in the Middle East, song lyrics, study guides, use of the greatest name, things like that. And if you're any specific questions about those things, please get in touch. Um, the email address here is review at usbnc.org. 
Um, so I want to return by just uh, end by returning to some of the uh, larger questions again. Um, it, the idea of any kind of uh, pre-publication review can initially sound like censorship. And uh, it, like a lot of other things in the faith, it's one of those things that we really need to take a very close and deep look at what it is we're really talking about uh, before we uh, you know, transpose concepts from one context and from another, which might be, be very different. So let me uh, show you a couple of quotes where the House of Justice has directly responded to this question, which of course has come up. Um, they wrote, if the question of review is raised by non-Baha'i academics, let the Baha'i academic say that this is an early stage. In this early stage, the development of the faith, this is a species of peer review, which they welcome, since it is primarily among their fellow Baha'is that they would find at this time, those who would have sufficiently wide and deep understanding of the faith and its teachings to raise issues of importance, which they would want to consider before publication. Uh, this also uh, brings up the question of how much do Baha'i authors rely on each other? And um, you know, academics and some other authors are used to doing this, but in my experience, most Baha'i authors are not. And so the first time any Baha'i has really seriously read their work is when they submit it to the review office. And um, if Baha'i authors got into a habit of relying on each other to give both frank and loving in the spirit of consultation feedback on their work, um, there could be a lot less reliance on the review office and it would surely, surely improve the uh, the, not only the accuracy, but the, the quality and the, the content of, of works. Um, uh, here's another response from the House to a similar question. Uh, given the long history and overwhelming current examples of oppression in the world, it is not surprising that in a country like the United States, which upholds freedom of speech as a cardinal principle, the non-Baha'i collaborator in a filmmaking project, such as you have described, would be concerned about any perceived or misperceived notion of censorship. A Baha'i author is expected to ensure, to the extent possible, a correct representation of the faith in his work. As an aid, he draws upon the reviewing facilities provided by Baha'i institutions, in the same way that scientists have acceded to the discipline of review in the interest of ensuring the precision and integrity of their dissertations. Baha'i authors respect the function of review in the community. And finally, why do we write books and articles? course, there's many different types of writing, uh, which serves many different aims, but I want to close with uh, what Abdul Baha said. The principal reason for the decline and fall of peoples is ignorance. Today, the mass of the people are uninformed, even as to ordinary affairs. How much less do they grasp the core of the important problems and complex needs of the time? It is therefore urgent that beneficial articles and books be written, clearly and definitely establishing what the present day requirements of the people are and what will conduce to the happiness and advancement of society. The publication of high thought is the dynamic power in the arteries of life. It is the very soul of the world. So thank you, and I look forward to your question. Uh, any, if anyone is interested in uh, serving as a volunteer reviewer, by all means, please email the office at review at usdnc.org. Thank you. Back to Rob. Thank you so much, Martha, and thank you so much to all of our panelists. Uh, your um, discipline in uh, timing is quite remarkable. The four of you averaged uh, 10.5 minutes each, um, very close to the 10 minutes we were aiming for. So if you all could put your cameras back on, we can now um, have the question and answer, and we have uh, 17 items in the q and I'm glad to say, plus various things in the chat, which are often thank yous. The midwife analogy was particularly popular from the looks of things. And uh, I'm glad to say that, that uh, people very much appreciated that. Um, and perhaps while we're getting started here, Boyd, if you'd like to put up the poll, perhaps we should give people the chance to start on the poll because the poll takes a while and all of everybody in our audience, and we have a very large audience today, I count 72 participants, uh, which is quite a, a nice number. If everyone could uh, respond to this poll um, and we'll do the Q and A while you're working on it. We, we won't uh, take separate time for it. We will all be quite interested, I think at the end to see what the results of the 
the poll are. So now turning to the questions and sometimes their comments. Um, trying to find, that's just a comment. What about spiritual poetry versus manuscripts? Does it go through the same editorial and review process? Go ahead, May, if you'd like to respond. So briefly, yes, it does. Um, everything that has the high content uh, goes to review. Um, so how do you review poetry? Well, I guess uh, Martha would have something to say about this, but <laughs> I, I would think in the same way that anything else is reviewed. I, I personally, I mean, poetry doesn't sell very well, as all poets know, but I personally have wanted to champion Baha'i poets uh, because I feel that I mean, we feel that this is a, a contribution to the development of Baha'i culture, and it's really important. Yeah, and, and I quite agree. We've got quite a few auth authors of poetry in the United States who have been self-publishing, and uh, so there's quite a lot that's come out that way. Uh, and of course, uh, we've had some very good poems and poets in the past as well. Susan Gamage asks, what percentage of the submissions get accepted? We probably have to hear from two different publishing trusts for that one. Uh, yeah, I can, I can jump in and respond briefly on behalf of the publishing trust. I mean, I don't have a, any kind of figure um, to really give you an accurate answer to that. I think I think it's safe to say a pretty small percentage of the submissions get accepted for publication. We definitely get a lot more that we, you know, that we find that we have to reject. And I think that the way we think about this has to be reframed a little bit, uh, particularly, you know, for authors, because I think the way in which the technology is evolving for self self publishing and on-demand printing and distribution, it's it's really uh, coming to a place where um, a lot of the stigmas and limitations that used to exist surrounding self-publishing are are going away, and it's it's really in the hands of anybody to publish a book. Um, so you know when you do submit something to a publisher, it should always be with the understanding that they have a very limited amount of resources. They have a particular mandate, they have a particular schedule and, you know, they're not able to accept everything. And that doesn't necessarily mean there's no value to what you're doing and that, you know, there are not many, many other avenues for you to, to share your work and publish your work. But yeah, the, the short answer is we, we accept quite a small percentage of what, what comes to us. Any other comments about that? I would say uh, exactly the same. Yes, I would have said exactly the same thing. Um, we, we don't, the, the number that we actually accept is very small compared with the number that we that get submitted. But it, it, it's, it's because we don't have the resources to, to, to deal with more. Uh, sometimes we, we um, have rejected books that we think have, have got quite a lot of merit, um, but we can't can't make them financially viable. Yeah. Uh, that that's 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 sometimes a problem. Yeah. Here's another interesting question. Oh, go ahead, May. If I may, just briefly, and another analogy. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm a singer as well, and singers do auditions. And you have to know when you do an audition that if they don't take you, it's not necessarily because you were bad. It may be because they're looking for somebody who is um, taller than you are. It may be that they're looking for a different color of voice. None of that is your fault. And it's the same with books that we, we've had to reject books that we, you know, we were, felt it was very painful to, to reject. 
And sometimes uh, when that happens, we've tried to um, suggest another avenue of publication. As Bahaj says, self-publishing is now getting so much easier. The distribution problems are always the, the, the nitty gritty of it. But, you know, anyway, there we are. Thank you. Um, Demita asks this interesting question. She has a book that she's been working on, which involves paintings and um, text. And she wants to know if it would be quite a blessing if someone could help her with the book. And she also says hello to everybody. So I think this is a question, to what extent do you help people who aren't necessarily going to publish with you? Uh, which of course is a, I'm sure you all get that question as well. Um, well, yeah, we we can't always offer as much feedback as as we'd like to um, with a project. That if 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 a project comes to us that's not a good fit, um, which you know I can't speak uh, specifically to this this project. I don't know if if it would be or not, but we would you know anything that's submitted to us gets gets very careful consideration and evaluation and um if if it is something that we think we can work on but needs work I, you know similarly to what erica had said earlier um we try to offer some feedback and direction and suggestions and even at times suggest potential collaborations with other authors and things like that but um we can't always provide as much feedback as, as we would like sure. I might want to add that the Wilmot Institute has a course called Writing Histories and Biographies that is run every year starting a, sometime in November. It's a seven week course. And several people who have taken the course were able to publish subsequently. Uh, like both books, I think, came out through George Ronald. Um, and in fact, one of those authors is now also one of our faculty for the course. So one of the nice things about that course is if you've got a manuscript that you're working on, you can um, take the course and then submit perhaps a chapter or two to your mentor who possibly can give you some ideas. We've even in some cases been able to refer to outside experts um, for advice when a particular question was, was tricky. So that's another option that people have. Uh, we also get, of course, uh, certainly I do, Often people are writing me saying, can you help? And I'm I, like the uh, like the editors, I have limited time. So I certainly don't want to uh, make any promises where that's concerned. We have another interesting question here. Would you prefer that authors send the completed manuscript or the first few chapters or a synopsis? Uh, or would it be worthwhile to query when a book is in progress? If so, how much of the manuscript would you want to see? We definitely would prefer to see a complete manuscript. Um, if they can give us a synopsis uh, of, of the manuscript as well, that would be really helpful. Um, we don't usually, uh, it, it would be very unusual for us to commit ourselves to publishing something before we've seen the entire book. Um, because we can't be sure that, you know, chapter 15 after chapter six is, is going to be any good but um but certainly yes we, we like to see the, the the entire manuscript yeah i would give a very very similar answer to the publishing trust for the same we're, we're open to looking at proposals and we'll try to give some feedback but rarely make a decision uh without seeing a full full manuscript that there would be, I, I, I entirely agree, except that so just sometimes we might get wind of, or somebody might write to us and say, I'm writing a biography of so-and-so, and the so-and-so is somebody that we feel the Baha'i world really needs to know about, you know, in which case we would write back and say, oh, yes, please go on, you know, and let us see it when you've finished it. Sure. 
Well, we have possibly uh, have an example of that right now with a, an email from Miriam mentioning that she's working on a biography of her father who was the first Somali Baha'i. And uh, she goes on and talks a little bit more about that and says that she needs a lot of assistance. And are there any possibilities for help finding co-authors and researchers? And to what extent are publishers able to help where that's concerned? Well, I wonder if the Wilmet Institute course you mentioned would be a, a good resource for that, Rob. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. I think she was in it, in fact. Or as, as Martha suggested, um, it, I, mean, I, I, I see, I, I think this is a really interesting thing because yes, um, there are going to be people out there who could help, but the author in question may not know them. So I wonder if there is one, a way of being able to set up something um, I mean, if, if, if somebody asks us that question, we, we, we would also be looking at people we already know who might be able to help. But yeah, I, I, I don't know if the Wilmette Institute can get involved in being a kind of um, clearinghouse. Or, Only to a limited degree, obviously. Yes, we don't have the time. <laughs> we don't have the time, obviously, no, to uh, no. help either. But uh, I think there's a wide range of possibilities because if people hunt around even in their own area, they may find people, for example, who can read over their manuscript and give them suggestions uh, if they've already got something written. If there's someone who they know writes clearly, the person can check and help with their grammar or spelling. And sometimes these are important and valuable additions to uh, any process of working on a book. Navid asks a question about uh, Amazon um, and does George Ronald generate the ISBN numbers of their books or does Amazon do it? Um, another, he has another book already on Amazon, not on a Baha'i subject. Can I create an Amazon store? Uh, I have two books there. and Do I lose control of it in the Amazon store since it was put there through George Ronald? This is a Navid, I guess, who's you've, you've published. Um, no, uh, if um, we always generate our own ISBNs for, for, for our, num our, our books. Um, and uh, yeah, an author is an author uh, as far as Amazon is concerned. And as long as um, the name is the same, so um, you, you, you don't, uh, you're not John Smith. Uh, for one book, and then John uh, F. Smith for another. Um, it, the, the names can be matched up, and, and you can set up your own author's page there. That's, that's not a problem. Um, Kim asks whether the presenter's slideshows will be available afterwards. Uh, and I should preface that by saying we will have all of the five recordings of these five sessions available on the Wilmot Institute's website in probably two or three days, depending possibly by Thursday at the latest. Uh, and it's up to the various presenters to provide us with their PowerPoints, preferably as a PDF so that we can put the PDF up. Not everybody can open PowerPoints. Uh, so uh, that's, I think, the best I can do there. Um, Irina says, can we get the date or title of the House of Justice letter May referred to, please? You're muted. I, I think Dwayne had it. I think it was 27th of August. Yes. I, I saw in the, in the comments or the, one of those things. That... Yes, and he says he says, hasn't been able to find it either. So. Oh, um, it, it, isn't it on... Uh, it, it, may have, it may have gone, well, we can send it to him. <laughs> well, if anyone has those kinds of questions, they can send those questions to the Wilmot Institute and we can also forward them on to the various panelists. If you don't have the panelists email information, um, we, we don't necessarily share the 
panelists' email addresses unless they give us permission to do so, but we can always forward an email to a panelist. Uh, Rob, I mean, Rob, you, it, surely um, since Angelina was quoting from that letter as well, and you also have a course on writing biographies and, you know, you, you will have access to that letter. I don't know if we were aware of it, so we may not have it in the course. You know, that's the uh -huh. thing is we only have things in the course that we're aware of. So <laughs> I don't know if we're aware of that particular letter. I also don't recall who developed the course. So, so I don't know. Um, Shaheen says, if a book is Baha'i inspired and doesn't have direct Baha'i quotes, but is about a central theme in the Baha'i faith, does it fall, does it require literature review? Yeah, and you have to look at it from the perspective of a reader and say, will the reader think that this book is representing the Baha'i faith? You know, if it talks all about peace and principles of peace based on the writings, and a Baha'i would recognize it and say, oh, that sounds a lot like something Abdul Baha said, or, you know, this is clearly written from a Baha'i perspective. But if, but if it doesn't mention the faith, the author's not identifying themselves as a Baha'i, and they're really writing it for a public audience so that a reader will not even know that this is representing the faith, they're just setting out the principles. So in that sense, Baha'i inspired, then there's really nothing to review because you know it doesn't represent the faith. It's just representing ideas and principles. But if it becomes clear, I mean, even because the, the author you know identifies themselves as the Baha'i on the back cover, then it shows you, like, oh, okay, this is really the Baha'i perspective. Then it really does need review. So it's a it can be kind of a gray area, but that's a good way to think of it. Uh, Deborah asks this question. I think you, you all, all may have already answered it, though. Does George Ronald review book proposals, thinking about reviewing, thinking about reviewing for concept and direction? I guess so. You, you re review them for the concept of the book and the direction of the book. There's no reason why we couldn't, but except lack of time. Um, I, I mean, George Ronald, although you saw six people up there on, um, on Erica's PowerPoint, in terms of, shall we say, man hours, we actually have about one and a half people. Yeah. So, it's amazing. You get as much done as you do, really. <laughs> well, we think so. <laughs> So we have um, an anonymous editor uh, asking, uh, how does a, someone like May address her process with poetry? What is the pr process of editing or reviewing, I guess in this case, editing poetry? Yes. Well, <sighs> okay, to start with, um, we we don't publish much poetry or despite although as i have said we really would you know we, we think that anything to do with the arts um really needs to be encouraged and uh, you know since poetry is something that that is on a page and can then be recited you know that um yeah so the way i approach it is to read it, to think, and and um, and to read it with a musical ear, if possible. Um, you know, the Guardian used to read his sentences aloud. Ruhi Khanum used to say, we, "We we know this from the Priceless Pearl." He used to read his books aloud to see, and and poetry, it you know, it's not just the intellectual content of, of poetry. It's the nobility of the words and their, their ability to, in, to uh, instill a sense of joy, a sense of rightness. That's, that, that's the kind of thing that, I, that I'm looking for. Fascinating answer. Rosemary asks this very interesting question. What about a romance slash love story with perhaps a Baha'i woman and a non-Baha'i man? Maybe something like the Amish romance novels that Harlequin 
publishes. People are smiling, but they're not responding. A publisher question or a review question? <laughs> <laughs> perhaps it's perhaps both. It was uh, meant yeah, to be a might, publishing. It might be good to get some comments from a review perspective. Yeah, that's a good okay. idea. So what's the question about a, a romance? Uh, a, a, Harl, a high Harl Quinn romance novel. Can we, can you? Uh, well, fiction is interesting in review. You know, fiction is interesting because you can't just write about perfect characters and Baha'is aren't yeah. perfect. So you can't just, you know, expect everybody to be living the Baha'i life when you write fiction and you want to highlight a Baha'i character, clearly. So um, the, the, I guess there's two considerations when it's something like romance-like. You know, one is, the teachings of the faith have to come across clearly to the reader. <laughs> you know, even if, a, if, if, even if a character who's a Baha'i character is struggling with, you know, any Baha'i laws or standards or behavior or whatever, um, that's human. And that needs to be, that story can be told, of course. But at least the reader has to know what the Baha'i teachings are. And it has to be obviously a sympathetic presentation of what the laws of the faith, you know, are about. Um, but the characters don't have to be, you know, they can be human for sure. Um, the other thing is, though, that, you know, um, we don't we want to observe all of the guidance in general in the faith about speech <laughs> and the quality of speech and communication, you know, and so something that is designed to be, you know, salacious or something. I mean, that has no place <laughs> in, in, quote, Baha'i literature. Right. I mean, you would, it, it just doesn't belong. It's not something that would be appropriate. So at that point, it's not just a matter of review. It's a matter of why is somebody even writing something like this? Um, but of course, and then again, if something has literally no Baha'i content at all, uh, it is not subject to, to review just because the author is a Baha'i. Yeah. Does that answer the question? I think so. But there's another question, of course, and that is the marketability of such a uh, Baha'i novel. And perhaps we could expand this and say something about publishing Baha'i novels because my understanding is that the market is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, we've we've done some fiction. We've done a few historical uh, fiction novels, and we've done a few kind of novels aimed at, at more of a junior youth youth age. I think it's very challenging to sell for a few reasons. Um, for one thing, I think people are not really looking to us for fiction, and they're not you know, coming to us for that reason. Um, but, you know, I think you have to think about how and why anyone buys a work of fiction. Usually you've read a review or it's been recommended to you or you know the um, reputation of the author and yeah. um, it's hard to generate that, you know, kind of from, from the ground up unless you're really getting reviewed in a bunch of places and, um, building some momentum for a work of fiction it is it is difficult to sell um so yeah we, we've experimented with it a little bit but it, it is challenging additional comments about that or shall we move on to the next question well i, I could imagine um somebody who is willing to spend 30 years um starting a series of detective stories where the detective might be a Baha'i, but it would be a detective novel. Yeah, I think there was actually The Consulting Detective was a, a book that's recently been published by the Publishing Trust on that. Oh, too. really? Oh, well, there you go. A Baha'i Sherlock Holmes. coming. <laughs> Uh, an anonymous uh, attendee asks this very interesting question about review. Who sits on the reviewing committee? How big is the committee? How do they get appointed and by whom? And do they have writing backgrounds? So here's a chance to hear about the US situation. Perhaps sure. we should hear about the UK situation as well when we, after Martha. Sure, no, it's a good chance to explain because it is different in the two countries. Um, in the US, there's not a committee, there's an office um, in which I serve as the coordinator of review. Um, the other reviewers are volunteers uh, from the Baha'i community. Most typically, they are authors who themselves have had books reviewed. Um, not always, but almost always, because naturally, you know, that's where you find the kind of understanding experience that lends itself to being able to be a good reviewer as well. Um, you know, some people 
review just occasionally because you know they have an expertise in some subject <laughs> which is really needed uh, for whatever reason um, and other times they could be generalists and people who are willing to do it on a regular basis a few times a year are greatly appreciated because it's the kind of thing that you develop you know capacity for by doing like pretty much everything else right but uh, it's very helpful to do it um, frequently enough that you kind of get a sense of you know what's within the scope of review what isn't how to deal with different things that might come up so um there's so there's not a committee um they are virtually always writers themselves and what else was the question is that it oh uh, who got how they get appointed and by whom they answered the yeah. question since it's yeah they're not appointed yeah. they're just they're um they're just they volunteer <laughs> and they're accepted and yeah and the review office is a staff as a staff position martha's full time yeah. my role a, is a staff yeah as a full-time staff position but um there will very soon be a, um, a job position posted for a staff position in the review office in the United States. So um, if you want, are interested in that, you can write to jobs at, at, um, at uh, usbnc.org or look for the announcement on the website. And please volunteer to review anybody who's interested. You don't have to be a writer, but some kind of writing background, obviously. And sometimes you have multiple reviewers for each work too, right? Yes, oh, there's, oh, yeah. For sure, for sure, yeah. And it's not nothing's just like passed through <laughs> without examination either. I mean, there depending on the issues, there can be multiple people involved in various ways. It's, it's not until the answer is clear does something go out. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, there's always the uh, if, if an author doesn't agree with a review comment or a conclusion, then um, they're always always open and want to hear from the author what their concerns are, discuss it, consult about it. Uh, it can go various ways. Often the author just isn't aware of how it's coming across to a reader. It's not even what they meant to say, but it's how it's coming across that's creating the problem. Um, in the end, if they don't agree and they want, they can appeal the decision to the National Spiritual Assembly or even ultimately to the House of Justice, like any other decision would be made at the national level. And that's been done many times too. Maybe I shouldn't say many, but that certainly has been yeah, done. It does happen occasionally. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's always very illuminating when it happens because everybody learns in that process. So it's not a bad thing. It's, it's a very important thing. Yeah. Comments about the UK system? The UK system is, is a slightly different. Um, everybody is appointed. There, there's a panel and everybody is appointed um, by the National Assembly. There's a coordinator and every time we give um, send a manuscript. Um, of course, we're, we're sending ones that have already been edited, so there shouldn't be very much that the, the review panel come back at, um, even though sometimes they do. Um, uh, and it, go, it goes to three uh, people who are on the panel. The, the, the coordinator asks three, three of the reviewers to, to, to say something. To, to, to look at, at the book. Um, and uh, he then collates their, 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 what they've said and uh, passes that back to, to the editor. Um, and, and they've now put in a, a, a slightly different process as well, where, where they each of the reviewers comments on the reviews that the, the other reviewers have, have submitted, which makes it rather a, a lengthy process. Um, but yes, it, 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 the, it, in the end, there shouldn't be too much that they come back with. Here's another interesting question for review. Would review uh, in the US, would the US office review a book in Russian? No, we don't have the capacity for that. Um, uh, things in Spanish, maybe, um, but other languages, typically we would refer the author to the National Assembly of uh, where that language is spoken. And you know, if they don't have any kind of reviewing facility, then we'd have to inquire further. Kim says, my children's book has been accepted by the reviewing committee and I would now like to send it to the Baha'i Publishing Trust. Is there a person there to whom I should address it? Yeah, I, I can put a link in the, maybe if I put it in the chat, that's the most helpful thing that would, that'll 
show our submission <coughs> guidelines and the steps involved there. That's good. Sally asks, books on social discourse, are there any, some examples of titles and are these part of the One Voice Press series? Sorry, this, this is about books on social discourse? Social discourse, asking for examples of some titles and are they part of the One Voice Press um, series, I guess. Okay, um, <clears throat> well, I mean, it's a, it's a category of book that we're, we're definitely interested in. Um, one Voice Press is just one of the publishing imprints that the Publishing Trust sort of operates. Now, it, it, it was actually the name of a small independent Baha'i publisher um, that no longer is active and they, they sort of passed the, their titles and their, and their name along to the Publishing Trust a few, a few years ago. Um, it's not necessarily exclusively for those types of books. It's a, it's an imprint that we can use if there's a book where it makes sense to have a less direct uh, association with the faith in terms of the imprint name. But um, really, anything that comes to us, we'll we'll consider, you know, whatever the best course of action is as far as the imprints. It's not right. Here's another interesting question. Who provides the illustrations for a book? Well, uh, for us, it, it, it depends. Uh, sometimes we get submissions that have both text and illustrations. Um, and then there are others where we have um, contracted a solicitor, we uh, an illustrator we've um, accepted something just, just based on the strength of the text and, and we've contracted and paid for illustrations. But that is a, a good question because it is it can be quite a challenging and expensive um, prospect to, to contract an illustrator. So sometimes if something comes to us with illustrations, it, you know, it might have more of a, of a chance if it, if it fits the profile of what we're looking for uh, for us yes i mean sometimes we get books that where an author has already got an illustrator in mind um, and sometimes not and i mean again illustrators are artists and should be encouraged and they should be you know be able to earn a living from what they do as well so we, as uh, as Bahar says, it can it can be expensive. Uh, um, I, but I think it, it, if whoever asked that question wants to look at the um, presentation that was given on children's books, there's quite a lot about illustrations yes. in, in in there. Yes. When you put it up. Yes, that that's a good idea. Because at the children's book, there was uh, one entire person, Elahe Bos, as one of the presenters who spoke about um, how she illustrated books. And I believe even the other presenter spoke about the health question of various illustrators that she'd worked with. Yeah. Uh, Sally also asked this very interesting question. Might an author be able to have a few books for a local signing? I guess the whole question is what do we mean by have? Yeah, I mean, the, the Publishing Trust does provide some complimentary copies to authors, but they also, um, you know, the, the distribution service will, will work with an author to, you know, to try to uh, make sure that books are available for, for events. Um, that's something that, that would be coordinated. As an author, I can say you, get, you can get a discount to get your own copies of your book, and then you can sell them at the at the cover price if you want to, <laughs> or just discount them onto the people signing them too. Erica, do you want to talk to that? Yeah, we we give a discount 
to um, to our authors, and um, if they want to uh, buy copies from us uh, at their discount discounted price um, and take them off to something, uh, then that's fine. Um, you know, a lot a lot of them. Um, oh, just just recently. Um, we had um, a conference here and one of our authors was, was uh, signing books. Uh, in fact, in, at that point, we were selling, selling the books rather than, than he was. Uh, but uh, for other authors where they've said, well, I'd, I'd like to go to this conference and sell my book. Uh, and we're quite happy, yeah, provided there's not um, a bookseller at the conference. If there's a bookseller at the conference, then we would make an arrangement for the author to sell uh, through, through that bookseller. If there wasn't, then we're happy to give the, the author a discount so that they can have a stash of the books. And the, um, they, they can pay for the books through their royalties. So, so um, the, the cost of the books might might be set against against their royalties, rather than having them having to um, put money up front. Joyce asks, uh, "Will the Baha'i Publishing Trust, and I suppose this was true of George Ronald as well, consider local histories of Baha'i communities, or is the audience too small to warrant using those resources?" Uh, we're certainly open to to receiving those manuscripts and, and evaluating and consulting on them. And it, it could be that the decision would be that the, the focus is too local or narrow for the publishing trust to to publish it. Or it could be, you know, and there could be an exceptional reason that the, that the publishing trust would would publish it. It would really depend on the on the manuscript. Moving on then to the next question, do articles submitted to secular magazines need review? And does a uh, author from Alaska submit things first to the Alaskan National Spiritual Assembly? Uh, the first question, yes. I, if anything submitted for publication anywhere, not just Baha'i sources, um, would need to be reviewed if it meets those requirements of having specific Baha'i content uh, for sure. And um, yes, it should go, the Alaska has its own national assembly. So when I referred to US, I meant, you know, within the jurisdiction of the US National Spiritual Assembly, Alaska and Hawaii, clearly those would be the reviewing um, bodies for residents of the jurisdiction. Though if you were submitting it to uh, a publisher within the 48 states, it would be reviewed Correct. down here. Correct. Yeah. 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 But if it's self-published, it should go to your own national assembly. Right. If the content is not timely in terms of the political situation in Iran, what does one do? Wait for a regime change? I guess so. I mean, we have to be very careful about things that are written um, concerning, you know, Iran, the Middle East, Israel, <laughs> to some extent, right? So uh, those questions, um, the, uh, if the if the review office isn't equipped to know uh, what might or might not uh, create a danger for the Baha'is or be inappropriate for Baha'i to publish for safety purposes, um, it will uh, get guidance from the Office of Public Affairs or you know the National Assembly or the World Center or whatever. I mean, those are particularly sensitive issues. Sometimes. Exactly, we we have sometimes written to the World Center about such questions, and I think we still have a manuscript which was absolutely fascinating. I see Erica nodding, the one about Baha the House of Baha'u'llah in Iraq, oh, yeah. which the House of Justice did not want us to publish at, at that time, and I suppose not at this time either. <laughs> yeah. When I was in charge of literature review in the United States in the 1990s, right at the height of the trouble in South Africa, when people were being necklaced, you know, they were putting a burning tire around the person, and burning the person to death and that kind of thing. A Baha'i submitted a manuscript all about the Baha'is and some of them being involved in political activities in South Africa. That was not timely. That could have gotten Baha'is killed. So I don't know if that's been published since, but at that time, that was not the time to publish a manuscript uh, 
with so much tension in that country. Um, Mary says, what per percentage of children's picture book submissions do you accept and produce as they tend to be more costly with illustrations? Well, in our case, it's a similar answer to, you know, to all manuscripts, really. It's, uh, it's a small percentage that we, that we accept, but we are producing children's books quite, quite frequently, quite regularly. So, you know, we do, we do accept and, and publish them, but it, it is a, a small percentage. I think that's pretty much the answer as, as before. Uh, Deborah asks, she asks, first of all, how many titles can you publish each year? And that question was answered earlier, but then she also says, how far ahead do you plan and that's a very interesting question. Well, yeah, in recent years, the Publishing Trust has produced, I think, like about 15 to 18 new titles a year. Um, the how far ahead do we plan is an interesting question. It's, it's, there's always plans, there's always looking ahead a year two years uh we all we always have projects kind of mapped out and um goals in mind and but then you know we also get as the publishing trust you know we'll be deep in the work on a couple of projects and then suddenly we'll get a manuscript from the world center that we have to produce and turn around in, into a book uh, as soon as possible and you know the plans are are always are always very flexible and, and um, you know, constantly changing. But the idea is to, to always be forward looking. Erica, is that one for you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> we, we, we publish, well, well, we have up till now published eight titles a year. Um, and it usually takes us about two years from the time that we get a manuscript that we like to the time that we've got finished books. Uh, some of that time could be spent in a queue. Um, and it depends. Uh, again, if, if, we, if we get, um, as we have done sometimes, um, a, a manuscript that seems absolutely timely, uh, and and we we cannot wait to to, um, to 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 publish it in 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 its its own sequence. Then then we will pull it forward. Um, but we're we're uh, on the whole we're not we're not really driven by um, by plans uh, and I think it was um, was it was it wasn't you was it it was somebody else who who, who said uh, that that um, you know what what were our plans well just to say in business mm -hmm. is is a, a, as much of a plan as as, as we have um, and now because uh, as May said we we were we thought that we were closing down and the house had said no please don't. Um, we're, we're having to regroup and um, so we're, we're, we're still planning the planning uh, basically. Um, yeah, so, so we, we're, we're not sure where we're going from here. We have a lot of questions and we're already at the bottom of the hour. So I don't think we can take very many more. Um, and it, though I must say our, our, our audience has held up pretty well, which also surprises me. Uh, Sally says, uh, does the author retain the copyright? That's an that's a important well, for, for the Publishing Trust, uh, a lot of our titles are published in the, in the copyright of the National Assembly, but exceptions are often, often made and, and usually are if the author uh, requests. 
Yes, in, in our case, the author always obtains, uh, uh, keeps the copyright, um, but our agreement stipulates that um, the author gives George Ronald the rights to publish the book and to negotiate other rights, language, other language editions, or should we say coffee mugs, t-shirts and film rights, etc., and oh. electronic rights. Um, so that, and, and, and then uh, the author gets royalties, of course, um, and for, for each of those. Um, we like to keep the administration of language rights with us in order to, partly to avoid um, confusion, because you, you don't want the author to have sort of given, for instance, the Spanish rights to a Latin American publisher when we might already have given them or had be had had interest from say Spain. You know, you 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 can get into a mess that way. So we need we, we like to handle the rights ourselves. William asks a, a long question about educational materials and texts for training institutes and for branch courses and such. Will publishing trusts and Baha'i oriented publishers be involved in publishing educational texts and materials for branch courses and other specific educational needs? And how will this need be addressed and developed? I'm not, I'm not sure if that refers specifically to the training institute, I mean, to the, to the Ruhi materials, which the publishing trust is not involved in, in developing or or publishing. I mean, we are a, a distributor to some extent, but um, that's not something that's directed by by the publishing trust. And George Ronald is not involved in in publishing that kind of material either. Now, it's frequently uh, thin um, booklet size types things too, which are also more expensive to uh, distribute to people. It seems to me. Um, Justice, and perhaps this is a good question as the last question since we're getting kind of late here. Justice says, what recent book surprised you with its popularity? Any ideas? I'm um, trying to think of something that was a surprise. I, I, I don't know if I if I answer that, it might be slightly insulting to the author. Um, yeah, I'll just say what well, one of our most one of our best sellers in recent years has been a book called Baha'i Basics by uh, Frances Worthington, which was she she conceived that book to be in the style of that series that's called for dummies, you know, um, uh, and that's sort of the format of that book. Um, and it does very well for, you know, by our standards, it does very well on Amazon. It seems to be um, what people are looking for if they wanna investigate the faith. Wasn't a huge surprise, but that's one of our best sellers. We get all kinds of surprises, both positive and negative. Um, <laughs> Um, it's very difficult to tell, uh, but I think one of the things that did surprise us in more recent years was Prison Poems by Mafash Sabit, oh. which went completely viral. And the other one that constantly surprises us, as always being among the best sellers, I'm afraid, is Thief in the Night. <laughs> After 60 years more than 60 years that book has never been out of print and it always sells uh, and i'm sure erica has another one you know we all have our favorites yes i i think that the the one that 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 i i remember uh, most about were, um was was actually conscious courtship um with, with uh, about being married well, and, and and i can remember typesetting it and thinking I, why are we doing this book what what is it and and uh, yes it, it it really sold in extremely well 
Um, I see a couple of others that I think probably ought to be mentioned. One is a review question, Martha. How long does review typically take? And that's, I think, a, one of those important questions that we probably ought to um, address. Obviously, there's no simple answer to the question. So, yeah, um, I mean, the target is, you know, three months for a book link work um, in general. I mean, some we know from the beginning will take longer than that because they're specialized or very long or certain things. Um, how long things take is a function of availability of reviewers, um, as well as other priorities in the office. Um, there are cases, I mean, even though books should be sent to review before they're sent to a publisher, uh, sometimes that's not the case. <laughs> you know, people will say, I've already submitted this to a publisher, and sometimes they're academic. You know, there are people who are really on a deadline <laughs> for things. And of course, typically their books may also be the best because they're experienced writers, they're writing about what they're familiar with. And so, you know, they may not be that challenging to review, but in any case, when there is a deadline like that, other, even though it's in may, most, some cases shouldn't have happened, but when it is the case, um, the review office does make sure to uh, prioritize that, which of course means others, which are, you know, self-published manuscripts sitting in the queue, unfortunately get more delayed. <laughs> so it's a, it's a question of, you know, balancing priorities based on many different factors. Um, but uh, we do aim for three months. And as I said, there is uh, job posting uh, coming out. And so uh, a change in uh, some changes in the way the work is done in the office, as well as um, expanding and deepening our bench of reviewers, <laughs> volunteer reviewers um, should help with that. But I am well aware that in some cases, not all, but there are cases where review really does get unreasonably delayed. And it's really unfortunate because the house has specifically said, you know, review needs to be done expeditiously. And it really does. Need to. One other thing that um, someone pointed out to me is that the Wilmot Institute also has two other courses on writing. One is called Gifts of the Spirit, the Spiritual Practice of Creative Writing. Uh, and so it's a creative writing course. And there's, an, there's a, also another one that they, that's also offered. So we actually have three courses a year that's offered uh, to help people with their writing skills. And um, people can go to wilmotinstitute.org to uh, look them up on our uh, list of, of courses. And they are often quite popular and, and they seem to have been very helpful for some people. I think at this point, we should probably wrap up our program today. I want to thank our panel, Bahaj, Martha, Erica, and May very much for your presentations for the fascinating information that you've provided, the insightful answers that you've been able to provide our audience as well. And I wanna thank the audience so much for your patience as this went so long. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed it. And uh, thank you also for the uh, Pub Buy Publishing Trust for planning this entire series of five webinars on Saturday and Sunday. We hope to be able to do something like that again. I should mention that the Wilman Institute has a web talk next Sunday at two o'clock Eastern time with Nadema Agard talking about the divine feminine from an indigenous perspective. So if you're interested in learning more about that, tune in next week. Thank you, everybody. And we very much appreciate your involvement. Looking forward to seeing you all again some other time. Bye-bye.